One of the reasons we do Truth Currents here at Evergreen is because I believe we have the responsibility as Jesus followers to be intellectually solid enough in our thinking to be able to apply biblical truths to the current events and circumstances of our generation. We need to be able to recognize truth and identify it to live by it. We also need to be able to recognize what one writer called damnable lies. That is falsehoods that, that really do damaging and damning things to a culture. In this final week before an election, I want us to consider some damnable lies that are circulating in our day. Sometimes we get help from unexpected places in this process of recognizing what's true and what's false. The Democratic candidate for president, Kamala Harris, just a few days ago, uh, gave an interview where she openly stated her support for killing babies in the womb. That's not news. But she went on to assert that that, as she termed it, that fundamental human right actually overwhelms what I consider to be an actual fundamental human right. She connected the lies for us in her own interview. She was interviewing with Hallie Jackson of NBC News, and the question was about the issue of abortion rights. And the reporter asked her, what concessions would be on the table if you were president faced with a Republican-controlled Congress? With a kind of indignant spirit, Vice President Harris responded with this. She said, I don't think we should be making concessions when we're talking about a fundamental freedom to make decisions about your own body. Well, at least she didn't avoid the question, which she so often does in so many topics. Here, she was very straightforward, and it's a perfect continuation of her whole career. As Attorney General of California, she made it a, her mission to silence and suppress crisis pregnancy centers. Uh, she argued as a U.S. Senator that states should be required to do what she called pre-clearance before they made any state-level laws regarding abortion. In other words, she wanted the federal government to have the power to determine what states could do on the topic of abortion. She's been proud to be called the abortion candidate. She's run her campaign almost entirely on that issue. And she made a much publicized official visit to an abortion clinic, the first presidential candidate to ever do so. But she's been dishonest since the beginning of this campaign because she answers questions about abortion rights by saying, well, we just wanna, we just wanna codify Roe. We want Roe back. That is absolutely not what she wants. The left has never been satisfied with the Roe v. Wade decision. They just lived with it because that's what they had available. There is zero chance that progressives will settle for a return of Roe. What they want is federal legislation guaranteeing a woman's right. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I used the word woman. I should have said a pregnant person's right to have an abortion right up until the moment of birth and often at taxpayer expense. Now, you'll hear some Democrats object to that statement. They'll say, oh, no, 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 that's, uh, that's not at all. I mean, this, that, that's, a, that's a Republican myth. That's a conservative shibboleth, this idea that, 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 that she wants abortion with no restrictions. Well, then what you do is you ask that person, what restrictions on abortion would you accept? And when you hear a silence, recognize that that tells you everything that you need to know. Vice President Harris has not acknowledged even one single restriction that she will allow for abortion. Her running mate, Tim Walz, signed legislation in the state of Minnesota to accept no restrictions on abortions for any reason. When they tell you who they are, believe them. Note carefully, though, what she said. She said no concessions can be made on the question of abortion. The question that was asked her was, 
are there any are there any concessions if you face a, a, an opposition Congress? What she's suggesting, the reporter went on and pressed her about religious liberty concessions in particular, and the vice president was adamant. Religious liberty issues cannot trump, uh, pardon the pun, cannot trump her attitude that abortion is the most fundamental and basic rights of all of our rights. Now here's the problem. Religious liberty actually is a fundamental God-given right. It was recognized by our founding fathers. That's why it was put in the very first uh, amendment of the Bill of Rights. Abortion rights, on the other hand, the reason Roe fell in, in recent months is because the courts finally recognized that there is no constitutional right to abortion. There's no human right to kill babies. It was invented out of whole cloth from the very beginning. But what she's doing is she's taking an actual fundamental right and throwing it overboard and replacing it with a made-up right that just fits the ideology of death that she's comfortable with. She's promised that if she becomes president, she will press Senate Democrats to eliminate the filibuster in order to make it possible to go for broke on abortion rights. She has now said it out loud. She's connected the dots. She doesn't care what you and I believe. She doesn't care what conscience we must live by. She not only wants us to be forced to go against our conscience with no recourse, she wants to use our tax money to pay for it as well. Well, I've had some people object and say, well, you know, Donald Trump, he's not fully pro-life either. You're right, and I'm sorry about that. But here's the difference. Trump's position is leave the question of abortion to the states. If that is the approach that we take, certainly somewhere between 35 and 38 states will either outlaw abortion completely or severely restrict abortion. If Kamala is president, her position is no restrictions, no opposition, a federal law which guarantees unfettered and taxpayer-supported abortion across all 50 states. Those two positions are not the same. Well, I wish it was just abortion that we had to battle with her, with her candidacy, candidacy about, but maybe you've seen in recent days the, um, the video clips of her interviews um, that, that flow out of a 2019 ACLU questionnaire that she filled out before, uh, before she ran for, for president um, in the last election cycle. She argued at that point and still holds a position that prisoners in federal detention facilities should have access to ta taxpayer-funded gender transition surgeries. In other words, if you're a man or a woman and you want to become the other uh, and you're in prison, you have uh, landed in prison because you have had some sort of criminal or antisocial behavior, uh, she, she believes it's your right for us to pay for you to be physically transitioned to another gender. She checked the yes box on that survey when asked if she would utilize executive authority as president to ensure that transgender inmates receive transgender surgeries. She's on the record. She views mutilative transgender surgeries as a fundamental human right, there's that phrase again, and she believes it applies to those who are behind bars and should be funded by the rest of us. I find this position deeply troubling for at least two reasons. One of which is she is imposing a viewpoint that is radically opposed to a biblical understanding of what it means to be human. That's the first objection. Transgenderism in, as an ideology uh, contradicts the historic scientific consensus that a person is biologically classified as a male or female based on their DNA. Transgender ideology asserts that gender can be changed through identity or medical intervention. It rejects the well-established understanding of human biology by promoting the idea that gender is a subjective experience rather than a biological reality grounded at the cellular, cellular level of who we are. I've had people criticize me because they say your language is violence against transgender people. So let me be completely clear. I want to say this 
in, in the clearest possible terms so that I'm not misunderstood. Based on Genesis 127 and the entire host of scriptural support, I believe, and science has throughout human history recognized that sex is not something that can be altered surgically or chemically. It is a God-given identity that defines who we are as individuals. Ms. Harris's position not only undermines the biblical understanding of human identity, it would also force Christians and others with similar beliefs to violate their conscience by paying for procedures that contradict our deeply held moral convictions. You see, my first objection is that it is biblically unsound to believe what she promotes. But the second part of it is, if you want to take faith out of the equation, you can just look at it as a function of, of economic resources. I'm fundamentally opposed to this kind of policy because I don't want my tax dollars to go towards it. Here's the, here's the way to consider it. We live in a country that is already burdened by a national debt that exceeds $33 trillion. The idea of further burdening taxpayers by funding elective surgeries for incarcerated individuals is both irresponsible and unjustifiable. I looked it up. Transgender surgeries, depending on what procedures actually have to happen, they range somewhere between $20,000 and $100,000 per case. Not only that initial surgical expense, but there's a, you have to factor in the necessary lifelong hormone, hormonal treatments, post-surgery care, and mental health counseling that goes with this transition. The financial burden on the taxpayer becomes immense and unsustainable. Our prisons need to be about public safety. They need to be about uh, protecting the citizenry. They're not a petri dish for uh, ideological experimentation on what it means to be human. Kamala Harris's positions on both abortion and transgenderism are not just isolated political ideas. They are a dangerous converge convergence of bad science, medical malpractice, fiscal irresponsibility, and identity politics all wrapped up and gone haywire. She disregards the realities of biology, the integrity of the medical profession. She imposes an unjust financial burden on taxpayers. And even more fundamental, it undermines the purpose of the prison system and puts identity politics above public safety. What's my point? None of this is new. But my point is, in these final days, as we prepare to go to the polls and elect a new president, we need to understand that the Bible has already given us Proverbs. Proverbs are general observations about the way life usually works. They're not guarantees, they're not promises, but they are the wisdom of deep thinkers from ages past a wisdom that has studied and observed the course of human history and come up with general observations about the way life works. Let me give you a few examples that should remind us of what's at stake as we go to the polls next week. In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 28, it says this, When the wicked rise, people hide themselves. But when they perish, the righteous increase. Proverbs 29, 2, when the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when a wicked person rules, people groan. 29.4, the king gives stability to the land by justice, but a person who takes bribes ruins it. Verse 12, if a ruler pays attention to falsehood, all his ministers become wicked. Verse 14, if a king judges the poor with truth, his throne will be established forever. Verse 16, but when the wicked increase, wrongdoing increases, but the righteous will see their downfall. Verse 18, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained, but happy is one who keeps the law. The general observation of human history is that when leaders hold wicked positions that contradict the word of God, 
the culture they lead suffers. As you go to the polls, take your intellectually solid biblical thinking with you. It doesn't matter which personality you like. It matters which position is more likely to produce what the Bible tells us to pray for, a ruler who will leave us alone so that we may live lives of quiet godliness. Vote your conscience, but let your conscience be informed by your biblically sound intellect. Know the difference between truth and lies. This is Truth Currents. Well,